Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Cal OES. We're here to provide you a briefing on California's response to the ongoing storm efforts. Behind us, we have first responders from across the state who are working throughout the night and into the next few days as we respond to this disaster. Um, to get us started today, we're going to have a weather briefing from Eric Schoening from the National Weather Service. Hello everyone, Eric Schoening here with the National Weather Service. A strong storm system is moving into the state of California starting tonight and continuing through Tuesday. This storm is going to bring widespread impacts to the state. It's going to start with the winds ramping up tonight. Uh, overnight, we're going to see strong winds developing. Eventually those winds will reach gusts of 40 to 70 miles per hour in many parts of the uh, state, which will bring uh, damage to areas including tree damage. Of course, one of the biggest impacts with this storm is widespread moderate to heavy precipitation, especially across central and southern California. This will bring widespread impacts, including flooding on roadways, the potential for mud, land, and uh, mud and landslides, as well as the potential for debris flows on recently burned areas. We also see significant transportation impacts due to heavy snow accumulating in the mountains. So this is a very uh, big storm, very widespread impacts across much of the state that uh, we're hoping that Californians will keep an eye on uh, through the next couple of days. Thank you very much. With that, I will uh, introduce uh, California Department of Water Resources Director Carla Nemeth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Schoening. Uh, my name is Carla Nemeth. I am the Director of the California Department of Water Resources. Um, we are also tracking the significant storm events. Um, we are into atmospheric river number five. Uh, that will uh, begin um, tonight and last through Tuesday. Um, we are also forecasting a subsequent atmospheric river later in the week, um, possibly January 12th through 14th. So this continues to be a long duration event. Uh, we also have additional updates to our forecasting revolving around uh, geographic landfall of this particular atmospheric river event, a shift um, from the North Bay area to a um, little bit further south in the Southern Bay area, um, and moving uh, easterly through uh, the Central Valley. Uh, we have adjusted our uh, flood stage projections down from an original uh, 17 systems that we were watching very closely to 11. Um, we are working very closely with local county uh, offices of emergency services to make sure those communities are prepared in the event that we do experience flooding. Um, if you are... Uh, anywhere in California. We also urge you to stay connected to your local Office of Emergency Services. They will advise you of uh, evacuation warnings in your area if that pertains to you. Uh, given the ability for these events to um, come in stronger than forecasted, either in uh, rainfall totals that can uh, rise very, very quickly, um, we need you to stay focused on these kinds of notifications and be prepared uh, if you do get that notice to evacuate the area. Again, we are working under conditions of intense saturation such that even moderate levels of rainfall uh, can produce significant flooding impacts. And to talk a little bit more about the state's approach to impacts and support to our local communities, I'd like to introduce our Cal OES Director, Nancy Ward. Thank you, Secretary. As, as Secretary Nemeth mentioned, we've um, got several storms behind us, but we have several storms ahead of us. Still a very, very challenging situation to many, many communities statewide in California. Currently, right now, we have 424,143 customers without power. We have approximately 2,920 uh, individuals in shelter. Um, or excuse me, evacuated with only 199 uh, in shelter. But that is not really representative of the compounding effects that we're, that we're getting. So Cali OES has coordinated response resources prepositioned across the state to ensure that not only can we get 
to a, a, a vulnerable area quickly, but as uh, the storms play out, and as we saw even in last night's storm, some changes to the predictions of rain and wind, uh, we can move resources uh, in as quickly as we can to impacted communities. And the resources are swift water rescue teams, OES fire engines, high water vehicles, CCC crews, sandbags, uh, uh, sand, uh, and as well as commodities from the Federal Emergency Management Area to shore up sheltering uh, should com uh, communities find themselves in a larger evacuation than they may have anticipated, we can move those resources in as quickly as possible. I'd like to just talk about uh, briefly about the differences of floods versus uh, other types of natural disasters. Floods kill more individuals than any other natural disaster. We've already had more deaths in this flood storm since December 31st than we had in the last two fire seasons of the highest fire uh, acreage burned uh, in California. It really is representative that uh, our behavior uh, uh, is really representative of how we can keep ourselves safe. Water rises quickly, water cuts out evacuation routes. Uh, a car can float in 12 inches of water. So it's really, really extremely important that you stay vigilant, you listen to your county emergency alerts, that you heed the warnings of road closure signs, that you don't walk, um, uh, drive in water uh, that you can't judge the depth of. And to stay vigilant with an emergency plan, be ready it, should power outages, which we know will happen uh, uh, in a significant way over these next several storms and possibly compound over the storms that are coming. So uh, I, I just want to ensure that folks are, are being vigilant about what they do and the decisions that they make. And, and if you are asked to evacuate, please, please heed those instructions from your local emergency officials. And now I'd like to turn it over to Wade Crowfoot, Secretary of Natural Resources. Thanks so much, Nancy. <clears throat> Clearly, Californians are no stranger to these big winter storms coming off the Pacific, although at the same time we know these storms are supercharged by climate change. And given this well-recognized threat, California is quite organized to address the vulnerabilities, the, the threats that we're seeing now. I want to share a little bit about uh, how our state agencies are working together uh, to prepare for the coming storms, even amidst the storms we've already experienced. Our state federal joint flood operations center is fully operational on a 24 hour basis based here in Sacramento. Um, that is where the flood experts in the state are located, uh, bringing in information on river levels uh, every six hours, 24 hours a day, uh, connected to our local flood authorities to understand what needs local communities may have to address. That Flood Operations Center is working hand in glove with the State Emergency Operations Center, which we, uh, where we are uh, now. And the State Operations Center is, of course, deploying those resources, those personnel to both prepare and preposition, as Nancy mentioned, the equipment, the personnel across the state, and then to be able to respond very quickly. We also have additional departments that are figuring in uh, all day, every day, over the last several days. That includes the California Conservation Corps, 1,300 core members strong, 56 crews being deployed across the state uh, for the flood fight. Our CAL FIRE personnel in all local units are ready and able to respond to emergencies as they evolve, and in fact, uh, several uh, are right now. Our state parks personnel, same, engaged on a regional and local level addressing needs, even as 85 state parks are either fully or partially closed. Now, investments that our state leaders have made are coming to bear uh, in real time here during the drought. Uh, the governor, the legislature invested hundreds of millions of dollars in so-called atmospheric river research to better understand this phenomenon of intense storms coming off the Pacific. Believe it or not, uh, thanks to this investment and a partnership with the federal government and the U.S. Air Force, there, are, uh, there is a C-130 that has actually been flying off the coast into this atmospheric river 
to collect data in real time that's feeding into these evolving models to give us a better indication of how intense these storms will be and where, where they will hit. Uh, state leaders have also invested over $700 million since 2019 in flood infrastructure. That's things like strengthening levees, expanding weirs, which is coming to bear. And that state investment attracted over about $2.4 billion of federal investment that has gone into strengthening our, our flood protection infrastructure. But look, let's not, let's not sugarcoat it. While we are deploying some of the world's most advanced technology to predict uh, the threats we now face, Mother Nature is full of surprises. So it's clear that we have to be ready. So I'll, I'll conclude with, with four things that we can all do to keep ourselves, our families, our communities safe. First, stay safe, stay dry, and stay home. If you don't have to be traveling during peak periods of the storm, please don't. Be prepared for power outages and other interruptions. Have those flashlights, the candles, batteries, charged cell phones at the ready. Number three, check on a vulnerable neighbor. Seniors, the homebound, we have to protect each other uh, and keep each other safe uh, during this, this, these intense storms. And then lastly, follow emergency directives. Um, we have professionals that know these threats well. We have public safety personnel that are working 24 hours a day to keep us safe, and we help them by following those emergency directives. So with that said, I will turn it over to my colleague, Major General Matthew Beavers of the California National Guard. Thanks, Wade. I wanted to give you a sense this afternoon of the scope and scale of the Guard response so far. Right now we have 28 high water vehicles arrayed across the state to help first responders, both local, state, tribal, county folks, to ensure that they can navigate in waters that potentially locals can't do. In addition to that, we have three rescue helicopters also currently deployed, two here and one in the Bay Area, one up north, so actually four. We also have an MP company, the 270th MP company, on standby. We also have the 649th Engineer Company on standby to provide a menu of consequence management uh, capabilities in case those are needed. Again, centrally located here so we can deploy them rapidly across the state. And with that, I'll be followed by Kim Johnson, the Director of Social Services. Thank you, General. The California Health and Human Services Agency continues to mobilize across the state. We've prioritized people who are unsheltered, those who are older are medically vulnerable, people with disabilities, as well as those residing in our congregate settings, whether they be medical or non-medical. With the Department of Social Services, we are grateful for the partnership of local counties and the American Red Cross, who are currently supporting 11 congregate shelters across California in six counties, as well as additional non-congregate sites. In addition, 14 additional shelters are pre-staged across nine counties that are ready to quickly stand up within two hours as needed. Temporary shelter, food, and additional resources are available at these sites. All are welcome, no identification is required. In addition, many counties currently have warming centers open and available to support unsheltered persons and other populations that have been impacted. You can check local county websites as well as www cdss.ca.gov to find these locations. In addition, the Department of Social Services and the Department of Public Health continue to provide up-to-date information and resources for the adult and senior care settings, skilled nursing facilities, and other operators of licensed programs. These operators are required to have emergency plans in place to ensure the health and safety of residents in their care. Any facilities who have been evacuated as a result of the weather and have a new temporary location, those sites are available at dss.ca.gov. And also, you can reach the statewide long-term care ombudsperson. Their crisis line is available 24-7 at 1-800-231-4024. In addition, the Emergency Medical Services Authority has pre-positioned assets and staged ambulance strike teams to be prepared. The Department of Public Health is proactively engaging with healthcare partners that are most likely to be in impacted. Our ho hospital partners continue to battle the effects of various respiratory viruses, including COVID as well, and we thank them for all that they're doing. It is not too late to prepare. Visit our website at chhs.ca.gov and download your template to create your personal emergency plan. This is especially important for those who have access or functional needs. 
Again, each of us can do our part by checking in on our neighbors, connecting with the older people in your life and other support to persons who might need help. And finally, given all that's going on, we recognize you may be overwhelmed. And if you would like to just talk to someone to get some additional support and who, someone who will listen with compassion, counselors are available right now at 1-833-317-HOPE or 1-833-317-4673. Also, you can visit the website calhope.org. With that, I'm glad to turn it over to the Calway, California Highway Patrol's Acting Commissioner, Sean Dury. Thank you, Director. Uh, good afternoon. First responders, including CHP officers, have been deployed throughout the state and have been assisting people in response to the winter storms that we're experiencing. Flooded roadways, downed trees, and power lines are making travel particularly difficult. If at all possible, we're encouraging you and asking you to please postpone travel in those areas to allow cleanup crews and power companies to do their jobs. If you are out on the roads, treat all downed power lines as if they're live. Don't try to move them. Don't try to drive over them. And please, just report their location. Watch for falling and downed trees. Trees are posing a significant threat in this storm due to the high winds and severely saturated soil. The number one thing you can do to ensure your safety while driving during these storms is slow down. Please do not ignore road closure signs or attempt to cross flooded roadways. This is very dangerous and a risk that's simply not worth taking. And I'm going to add my voice to the, those that have been given today. If you are asked to evacuate, please do so. Have a plan and be prepared. CHP officers, along with other first responders, have increased staffing for the storms and are ready to assist you. If you need our help or if you have an emergency, please call or text 911. Thank you and stay safe. And with that, I will turn it over to the Dir Deputy Director of Caltrans, Mike Kieber. Thank you, Acting Commissioner. So Mike Kieber, Caltrans. Um, right now, we have, we're doing everything we can to keep the roadways open, but safety is and will remain our number one priority. We have over 4,000 of our maintenance crews that are out there doing everything they can whenever there's a break to uh, open the roadways back up. I do want to reiterate the message. If there is a closure, please, it may not be apparent to you where we place the closure, what the hazard is, but there is a hazard, and we ask that you do not go around it. We will pick up the closure as soon as it is safe. We're working with uh, uh, all of the entities here and with uh, local officials uh, to take the steps uh, in, the, in the event of an evacuation. We have our tra traffic operations uh, staff uh, ready with uh, detours as needed. Again, if you, if you can avoid travel, we ask that you do that. We have our CMS message signs that are out there uh, that will provide additional information as the situation uh, changes. If you do want information, I want to encourage you to use the Quick Map app it provides push notifications, gives you the latest information on the roadway closures and real-time information on when uh, they'll be reopened. Again, if you can stay home, we encourage you to do so. If you do see Caltrans and other highway workers out there, please, they're out there for your safety. Let's return the favor. Let's make sure that they all return home as well and let's keep them safe. So please slow down. Please move over. Um, let's. Be safe and stay safe. Thank you. Governor. No, appreciate it. So, uh, you know, we've been at this how many days and uh, expect to, uh, to see the worst of it still in front of us. And I think that's the message we want to underscore today. Uh, we're anticipating some very intense weather coming in tomorrow, tomorrow evening in particular, into the early hours of Tuesday morning. And that's the imperative that we're trying to express here is the seriousness of purpose in terms of just being safe and being thoughtful. Use your common sense. You heard that uh, from a number of the speakers here over the course of the last a uh, few moments, and that is uh, don't te test fate. Um, you know, Nancy said it well. I mean, just a foot of water, and your, your car is floating. You know, half a foot of water, you're off your feet. Uh, half a foot of water, you're losing control of your vehicle. We're seeing people go around these detours because they don't see any obstacles. They think everything is fine. 
uh, and putting their lives at risk or putting first responders' lives at risk. And so it's really important that people are mindful and, again, just use their common sense. I, I know, and listen to Kim, um, I know what was going through my mind when she talked about people's minds uh, and the stress, the stacking of stress uh, that we've been through over the course of the last number of years, and, and here we go, this weather whiplash from one extreme to the other. It's just a few months ago we were talking about these heat domes uh, and the extreme heat. Uh, it was just literally a month ago down in Southern California, they, they took their drought declaration that impacted about 6 million people and extended it to 19 million people because of the severity of the drought. That was just 30 days ago, and here we are 30 days later talking about number five on the way to number six, maybe seven, atmospheric river in just a matter of weeks. Um, Wade is right. We know a thing or two about atmospheric river, rivers. Uh, that, that term was coined here. Uh, out of our universities here in the state of California. Uh, not only are we mindful of uh, the frame and reference, we're very experienced in understanding them uh, in terms of the natural realities and the acuity and the intensity uh, of these atmospheric rivers. But I think part of that acuity and intensity has led, as uh, Wade said, to uh, a deeper understanding and a sophistication in terms of our data, our modeling, and our forecasting. These C-130s that are going in uh, to these storms brought back information that we uh, a year ago would never have had, we wouldn't have been privy to. Even with all of the fancy satellite technology and all the federal resources, we wouldn't have had the resources that we've been uh, provided and provided ourselves uh, through our appropriations um, uh, had we not invested in these technologies, in these tools, uh, and developing a deeper consciousness because we are deeply mindful of living in this new normal of extremes. Uh, we talk about weather whiplash. We talk about extremes as it relates to Mother Nature. Uh, people have referred to global warming now as, as you know, climate change to global weirding. Uh, you know, just, you know, hots, I've said it a hundred times. Hots getting a lot hotter, dry is getting a lot drier, but the wet's getting a lot wetter as well. And as a consequence of this, not only in terms of our deeper understanding and our consciousness as it relates to our lived realities, but also in terms of policy making, we are moving dramatically in different directions. We put out $8.7 billion in investments to address the issue of infrastructure related to droughts. In that infrastructure plan, it's not specific to droughts. It's specific to conveyance. It's specific to strategies on stormwater capture and groundwater replenishment. It's specific to strategies as it relates to dealing with these extremes and capturing more of the flood flow uh, during times like this. Wade uh, referenced 700 million. It's $738 million that we've invested in the last two years specifically in strategies in this space. Uh, we are going to be requesting on Tuesday with my budget that is already in print uh, an additional $200 million, $202 million to be exact, of the legislature for more uh, resources specific for levees and urban um, uh, flood protection. We have a flood plan in this state. We have a Central Valley flood plan people are very familiar with in this state. We have a flood operations center in addition to this state operations center um, that uh, we have stood up. Uh, because, again, this is a familiar territory for us in the state. That said, uh, we are dealing uh, with an acuity, though, with the stacking of atmospheric rivers that do put pressure uh, and, again, require, again, deeper consciousness in this moment. We were just down um, ourselves, the team, uh, walking some of the sites with our uh, Conservation Corps team members that were out there filling up sandbags, uh, protecting some of the levees near Deer Creek. We were down around the Wilton area, Consumas River, uh, seeing a number of sites. Uh, anyone that's traveled around or just watched on television as news crews, thanks for all your good work. Uh, you've seen, you know, these, you know, trees that have collapsed and smashed cars, uh, homes. Uh, we're seeing uh, a lot of what we would expect with these high wind events. That said, the winds were unexpectedly higher than we thought last night. And I just want to underscore, when it comes to wind, a little less precise than precipitation 
in terms of our modeling. And that's where tomorrow night in particular, uh, we have some additional concerns around the unexpected higher gusts in addition to the intensity uh, of the actual precipitation and the flooding. We expect, because the storm is now moving south a little bit, San Jose area, um, particularly around commute time, uh, could be particularly challenging. Obviously, the Modesto area, Merced, and others uh, have been top of mind. We've listed, as was noted by Carla, we had 17 high profile sites of, of creeks and rivers uh, that we had identified, quite literally putting dots uh, that we've made public and working with local officials. It's down to about 11. That doesn't, it's not comforting that it's only 11, uh, but it is encouraging. It's down from that peak of 17. It doesn't mean things are getting better, just things means things are shifting a little bit to the south. And as a consequence, um, we're dealing with different uh, challenges now, perhaps a little more of an urban challenge than some of the Central Valley and North, uh, Northern California challenges that we had originally modeled even 48 or 36 hours ago. We've been in contact consistent with the White House, uh, uh, with the Chief of Staff, Ron Klain, who's been nothing short of spectacular in proactively reaching out. Uh, we will be reaching out formally uh, within the next hour or so under the Stafford Act, requesting of uh, the White House approval uh, through FEMA Region 9 of an emergency declaration to get this full support of the federal government uh, in our efforts, uh, which we have all the confidence that we'll receive based upon the conversations with the White House. So that formal request uh, is being advanced, as I said, within the next hour. Uh, this is in addition to the emergency declaration that we passed statewide uh, last Wednesday. Uh, we are doing all we can uh, to be as proactive as we can. You heard about all the prepositioning of assets, how CalGuard's doing uh, their best to preposition counties all across this state, not just individuals, but hard assets, these 28 uh, 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 vehicles that allow uh, for supplemental support, local emergency crews, uh, obviously the mutual aid system second to none here in the state of California. Uh, we've got urban search and rescue uh, teams out in addition to the helicopters and the other resources uh, that were advanced. You heard Caltrans, uh, Caltrans has got hundreds of crews up and down the state um, and uh, we're working to make sure uh, that we have the support to supplement uh, with our local officials. Uh, we continue uh, to, around the clock, be working closely with our local emergency offices as well as uh, local electeds to make sure that they have the resources they need. I'm mindful as these storms go through, particularly for locals, that their work begins after uh, those acute events, and that's cleanup, and that's uh, dealing with some of these high flows. Uh, Russian River area, Guerneville, uh, very familiar uh, with some of those challenges. So in the next few days, going through the extended week, uh, going to be um, a challenging time for us here in the state of California, but as always, we are up for it. I'll just close with what Director Ward said, because it is, I think, important just in underscoring the why we're here and why we are trying to be sober uh, about the next uh, 24 to 48 hours. Uh, with all the focus, understandably, on California wildfires, uh, it has uh, been a very sad uh, truth. In the last 10 days, 12 people have lost their lives to these floods, 12 people. Again, more than have lost their lives, civilians, that is, uh, to wildfires in the last two years. Uh, these floods are deadly and have now turned to be more deadly than even the wildfires here in the state of California. Common sense, uh, just be cautious over the course of the next week, again, particularly the next day or two. So proud of the team, proud of the good work, couldn't be more satisfied and grateful uh, by the federal response, Region 9, the FEMA director herself uh, proactively engaged the White House, uh, the chief of staff level. Uh, every request we have made has been granted. Uh, and again, I want to extend my thank you to the California legislature that over the course of the last few years has not only put out record resources to focus on how we can modernize our conveyance and diversion and water system to meet these new realities, uh, but has also been incredibly supportive of our targeted master plan for water. Uh, we went from 142 action items 
a few years ago to a 2040 water plan we put out in August of last year uh, that numerically has targets uh, in terms of storage, 4 million acre feet of storage that we put out. Uh, they have helped fund that plan and advance that strategy in a meaningful way. And I think that goes to a lot of questions that people have, including those in my household. Uh, with these storms, does that mean the drought ends soon? With these storms, how can we capture more of these floodwaters? With these storms and a deeper understanding that we may not have the normalcy of these extended years uh, in terms of traditional rainfall and have more peak rainfall, how are we modernizing our diversion and conveyance and infrastructure to meet that new reality? That plan lays out in detail uh, the funding from the legislature, making that plan real. A lot of work to do, mindful of that. Uh, but there's a vision and there's a strategy, and uh, we recognize the urgency of the moment to implement uh, and to make sure that we are prepared, not just for this week in the storms, uh, not just for the next year or two, uh, but for the next decades to come uh, as we tackle the most impactful force uh, in our lives, and that's Mother Nature. With that, we're happy to answer any questions. Governor Ashley Duvall, KCRA 3. Uh, what, with more than 424,000 people without power right now, potentially compounding issues with wind events expected, what is the communication like with utility companies between the state? Constant, never-ending, not just with the private IOUs like PG&E, but SMUD, SMUD in particular that's been challenged in the last uh, 24 hours, as you know. I think we were peak, depends on how you analyze it, 540,000 households and businesses, 520, 30,000 folks. Uh, we still have uh, work to do, as Director Ward mentioned, uh, to get the power back on. Mindful, again, that it was the winds last night, some predicted, uh, some that were more uh, and cute than had anticipated, and that's our big concern going forward, and that's why I appreciate uh, what Secretary Crowfoot said in terms of just being prepared uh, with your own flashlights, own uh, household uh, equipment as it relates to batteries and making sure uh, that you're protecting yourself, uh, particularly, again, during those peak hours of the storm coming in Monday and Tuesday, Monday evening into the late hours uh, and early into Tuesday morning. Director Ward said last week that the current state of emergency that you declared allows out-of-state resources to come in and help. Has, has, any, has there been a need so far yet to do that? Not at the level that, uh, that we can't anticipate, but notably for pg and &E, Yeah, pg and &E brought yeah. in uh, out-of-state resources in as far as Canada, and they'll ro be rotating them in. Uh, with the shift uh, to more outages in, at SMUD, they'll also be providing mutual aid to SMUD, PG&E will too. So they'll rotate those as they need it uh, in from other states as well. Are those resources for manpower, equipment, all the above? Trucks. All the above. Okay. Yeah, yeah, they okay. were sitting there waiting at the Oregon border uh, for that signature. Uh, they kept knocking on my door, said, get off the phone, uh, and uh, and uh, move them down. But uh, look, the, the resources, um, our capacity to surge is substantially greater than what we've currently uh, uh, required, and that's a big part of the under the Stafford Act of what we're requesting the president and the administration today. And uh, you know, without you know, what we're asking for, the feds is somewhat unique in this respect. It's more, I think, analogous to what you would see with a hurricane. There's anticipatory framework, and so we lay the the foundation of that in the conversations with the chief of staff that because of the sophistication now in the modeling, the deeper understanding of these atmospheric rivers, uh, our own research in addition to the federal research that's been done, the collective wisdom is we know what's coming and in anticipating that we're better off getting ahead of it as it relates to this request uh, than waiting for the actual event to occur. And so again, it's just it's the nature of the times uh, while this is a unique request in advance of, in so many ways, it's a, uh, I think, a, um, well, a preview of things to come. Uh, Mr. Governor and, and Mr. CHP Acting Director, thank you both for taking the time. Quickly, in terms of the message to Californians about those flooded roads. Yeah, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let the guys in uniform <laughs> talk about that. They'll listen uh, to them more closely. Can you, can you just go over the dangers and, and, and the message to Californians about not going through 
those streets. Yeah, absolutely. And we've seen it time and time in the, you know, over the past week. But, you, you know, cars are going, drivers are going around road closure signs and they're entering waters that they think they can traverse. And like the director mentioned, in 12 inches of water, your vehicle will start to float. You add to that a little current and the vehicle is quickly swept off the roadway into deeper waters, into ditches and canals and big and fields. And, and that's where you create something, a really true life-threatening emergency. And um, we've seen it time and time again here in Sac County, in South Sac County, there were several vehicles that were swept hundreds of feet from the roadway. So, yeah. I think what, what happens, you're an expert, but you, you see this, just because someone else does it, doesn't make it right. I mean, I seem to say that to my kids almost an hourly basis. Um, and so you say, well, there's a big rig, and well, that person's doing it, I'll just follow the big rig. You saw that on 99. Um, and uh, so people just, again, be, hyper vigilant and cautious and, and without belaboring the again and again um, commute tomorrow in some of our urban areas particularly in the Bay Area and the San Jose area is projected to be particularly challenging and so I think what you just heard is uh, is incredibly important and uh, we'll be talking a lot more about that tomorrow morning and we've been crystal clear with our local emergency officers uh, of the importance of doing that as well at the local light basis in terms of their messaging. Else? With that, just want to again thank everybody. Uh, team's been up. And we, I think I've been with you the last four, <laughs> the last five days upstairs, and uh, you know this is a familiar place for all of us. But uh, you know this is, I think, you know a preview. Uh, uh, this is what they all projected. This is what those climate scientists. Uh, all we're telling us about, and it's all coming um, uh, to a, a, you know, a reality here in the state of California, but we're up for it, and I couldn't be more pre pleased and uh, proud of my team. And um, again, I'll, I'll just close by saying, uh, because it's important, and it's also a preview of the budget we'll be submitting on Tuesday, um, how wonderful it is to have partnership uh, with our legislature in terms of their recognition of these challenges and the resources uh, they have provided the state of California uh, that we are currently utilizing and will be investing over the course of the next few years. Thank you all very much.